Today, we're going to wrap up our look at paracyclic reactions and learn a little bit about sigmatropic rearrangements. A sigmatropic rearrangement is an intramolecular reorganization of electrons. One of the things that sets sigmatropic rearrangements apart from the other types of paracyclic reactions we've covered is that it actually incorporates one sigma bond into the reaction mechanism. That sigma bond may be at the end of the pi system or it may be in the middle of the pi system. Figuring out which sigma bond is going to be involved in the reaction can be a bit of a challenge. We sometimes think of conjugation as sort of an alternating pattern of double and single bonds. And while that's not totally true, it is convenient to think about it that way sometimes. If you look at any given single bond and imagine for a minute that it is in fact a double bond, if that fake double bond would extend the conjugation of an existing pi chain, then that single bond could be involved in a sigmatropic rearrangement. So let's take a look at an example. Here I've got a conjugated diene, and it shows that familiar kind of alternating pattern of double bond, single bond, double bond. But if you imagine that this carbon-hydrogen bond that I have drawn out, if you imagine that that were a double bond, then it would extend the chain of conjugation. And that means that that CH single bond could be involved in a sigmatropic rearrangement. Now remember, all of the mechanisms for these paracyclic reactions are essentially the same. They only differ in the number of electrons moving around. So in this specific sigmatropic rearrangement, the pi electrons on the one end are going to push out and attach to that hydrogen, which will then break the sigma bond between the carbon and the hydrogen, moving towards the existing pi chain, and then push these pi electrons up. You can see from the product that this hydrogen atom has moved from one end of the carbon chain to the other. In fact, if you look really closely at this reaction, you'll notice that it's the dumbest thing you've ever seen. In this exact example, what we've done is turned 1,3-pentadiene into 1,3-pentadiene. So yeah, as drawn, there's actually no way to know that this reaction is actually occurring but it does serve as a nice simple example. Sigmatropic rearrangements have a naming convention that can describe a little bit about what's happening during the reaction. The naming convention can be a little bit tricky to understand, so I'm gonna show you an example. A sigmatropic rearrangement is gonna result in breaking one sigma bond and then making a new sigma bond. What we need to do is find both of those sigma bonds. And then we simply count how many atoms are in between those two bonds. Now, because the transition state is cyclic, that means there are actually two directions that we have to count the atoms. If we start with this sigma bond and go clockwise towards the next sigma bond, we see that we pass through only one atom, the hydrogen. But if we go counterclockwise to get to the other sigma bond, we would have to go through five atoms. And so this is known as a 1-5 sigmatropic rearrangement. The numbers are separated by a comma, and conventionally you put the lower number first. We'll take a look at how to use this naming convention on some other reactions a little bit later. But regardless of the sigmatropic rearrangement, the process is the same. Studying sigmatropic rearrangements can get pretty complicated, so we're going to try to keep it fairly simple here. We know that when dealing with paracyclic reactions, we have to concern ourselves with some frontier molecular orbitals. In sigmatropic rearrangements, because it only involves one pi system, it's kind of like with electrocyclizations. We only care about one FMO, and that's the HOMO. So if you look at this reaction, we have four atoms involved in pi bonds. So that means we have psi one through psi four, right? Four p orbitals in makes four pi molecular orbitals. And we can see that we have two pi bonds, so that's four pi electrons. However, with sigmatropic rearrangements, because we are breaking a sigma bond, in addition to moving around pi electrons, we actually have to incorporate one pair of sigma electrons into our total electron count. And that means that in this case, we actually have six pi electrons. And that would populate psi one, psi two, and psi three. So that's gonna make psi three the homo, and again, we only care about the symmetry of that orbital. And since the symmetries start with symmetric symmetry for psi one and then alternate, that means that psi three would be symmetric. That makes the homo symmetric. So let's draw out a simplified molecular orbital diagram of what's actually happening in this reaction. We know that in this case, we have a symmetric homo. 
On the one end of that system, we have our CH sigma bond, the sigma bond in the sigmatropic rearrangement. In order for that hydrogen to migrate to the opposite end of the pi system and do so in phase, in this case, that would require the hydrogen migrating from the bottom side on the left to the bottom side on the right. And since the migration occurred on one side, bottom to bottom, we again use that term suprafacial. If that hydrogen atom had to jump from bottom to top, then that would have been anterofacial. Let's take a look at a couple of examples that are gonna show us how important it is to recognize whether a sigmatropic rearrangement is occurring via a suprafacial or anterofacial process. So here I've got what is probably the simplest possible sigmatropic rearrangement. We've got one double bond, and again, if we look at this CH sigma bond and pretend it was a double bond, that would extend the conjugation of the pi system. So that's the sigma bond that's gonna be a part of our rearrangement. The reaction involves one pi pair and one sigma pair of electrons. So we're gonna have two curved arrows to describe the mechanism. Similar to what we just saw, one end of the pi system is going to push its pi electrons, grab that hydrogen, that sigma bond will then cleave and push towards the electron deficiency forms when that pi electron pair had moved. And yes, again, this is kind of a dumb reaction because we're turning propene into propene. Now, as far as naming this sigmatropic rearrangement, again, find the sigma bond that's being broken and find the sigma bond that has been made, and then count how many atoms are in between those bonds going in both directions around the cyclic transition state. So starting from this bond going clockwise, we can see that we would have to go through just one atom to get from the sigma bond to the other sigma bond. Going counterclockwise, we would have to go through three atoms to get to the other sigma bond. So this means we have a 1-3 sigmatropic rearrangement. Let's go ahead and analyze the frontier molecular orbitals that are involved in this reaction. We have two p orbitals that would create psi one and psi two molecular orbitals. And we have four total electrons involved, one pi pair, and remember, one sigma pair is also incorporated into a sigmatropic rearrangement. And here we've got thermal conditions, so that means that we're in the ground state, so we're simply going to fill psi 1 and psi 2. And that makes psi 2 the homo. And because the symmetries of these molecular orbitals alternate, starting with symmetric for psi 1, that means that psi 2 is going to be asymmetric. So we have an asymmetric homo. If we draw out a simplified molecular orbital diagram for this reaction, we see that the hydrogen atom, in order to go from being bonded to one end of the system to the other, would actually have to go from the bottom side on the left to the top side on the right to maintain that in-phase bonding interaction. Since the reaction involves crossing sides, we call that an anterofacial process. Now you might remember from our discussions on cycloadditions an interfacial process can't really happen unless the transition state has at least seven atoms in that ring. And in this case, the transition state is only going to have four atoms in the ring. And that means that it is too strained to actually do the reaction. In other words, this reaction doesn't work. So like what we saw with cycloadditions, not all reactions will work under all available conditions. Let's go ahead and see what happens if we switch the conditions for this reaction to photochemical conditions. So if we excite our ground state configuration, we would lift one electron up from psi two, and now we need psi three. That redefines the FMOs. Psi three is now the homo, and psi three is going to be symmetric, again, starting from symmetric on psi one and alternating. So now we have a symmetric homo. And as we saw earlier, with a symmetric homo, that means that the reaction is going to be superfacial. And like what we saw with cycloadditions, superfacial reactions don't have any limitations on the ring size in the transition state. And that means that this reaction can, in fact, occur. So the 1, 3 sigmatropic rearrangement of propene can only occur under photochemical conditions. The ring size formed in the transition state is too small to accommodate an anterofacial rearrangement. So we're gonna wrap up by looking at two fairly commonly encountered synthetically useful sigmatropic rearrangements. And they're actually pretty similar to one another. Let's start off by looking at the Kleisen rearrangement. The Kleisen rearrangement is in fact a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement of an allyl vinyl ether. So here we've got the simplest possible example. Look at that starting material, it's an ether. And on one side of the oxygen, we have a vinyl group, right? Just a simple alkene. 
and on the other side, we have an allyl group. In a Kleisen rearrangement, the sigma bond that's involved is actually in between two existing pi bonds, as opposed to on the end like we saw earlier. But again, if you look closely at this structure, we can see that it has to be this bond that's involved in the reaction. By changing this carbon-oxygen bond into a double bond, it would actually create conjugation. So that has to be the sigma bond that's involved in the reaction. So in a Kleisen rearrangement, the pi electrons on one end of the pi system connect to form a sigma bond to the other end of the pi system. Again, that would exceed the octet on that carbon that was just attacked, so we push electrons over, exceeding the octet, breaking the carbon-oxygen bond, which then fills the void left when that first pair of electrons moved. The result is that we make a new alkene and a carbonyl. Now that we know what the reaction does, we can take a look and see why it's considered a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement. So once again, we've got to look and see what sigma bond was broken and where the new sigma bond is formed. We start with one of those bonds and we see how many atoms we need to go through to get to the other bond. Starting here and going clockwise, we would have to go through three atoms to get to the other sigma bond. Going counterclockwise from that same bond, again, we would actually have to go through three atoms to get to the other sigma bond. So it's a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement. If we think about the frontier molecular orbitals involved in this reaction, we have those two pi pairs of electrons and the sigma pair. We're under thermal conditions here, so that means that we would populate psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. And that would make psi 3 the homo, and psi 3 is symmetric. A symmetric homo is going to result in a suprafacial process, and that means this reaction will work. Even though the reaction goes through a relatively small six-atom ring transition state, the reaction still is going to work because superfacial processes don't have any restrictions on the ring size of the transition state. A very similar reaction is the COPE rearrangement. The COPE rearrangement is simply a, another 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement of a 1-5 diene. Again, you can see it's got to be this sigma bond here that's involved in the rearrangement. If we imagine that sigma bond were in fact a double bond, it would extend the conjugation. The mechanism here is exactly what we saw for the Kleisen rearrangement. Pi electrons on one end of the system create a sigma bond to a carbon on the other end, pushing electrons through in a cyclic manner, completing the mechanism. And yes, this is kind of a silly example because once again, we're taking a reactant and turning it into the exact same thing in the product. We're taking 1,5-hexadiene and turning it into 1,5-hexadiene. Let me show you a really cool example. If you take a look, this is another 1,5-diene, except we've got it attached to this three-membered ring. From the perspective of the cyclopropane, this is a 1,2-divinyl substituted cyclopropane. But it's still a 1,5-diene, and that means it can do a COPE rearrangement. And when you do the rearrangement, it's going to break the sigma bond here that's part of the three-membered ring and close up a new ring by making that new carbon-carbon sigma bond on the right. So the reaction proceeds to give a 1,4 cycloheptadiene. Now, all of the paracyclic reactions we've looked at, whether they're cycloadditions or electrocyclizations or sigmatropic rearrangements, are all technically reversible. But we can use our knowledge of stabilities to figure out which side of the equation is going to be favored at equilibrium. We simply need to look and see what compound is more stable. This specific reaction is actually a useful reaction. Not only does it turn one material into a different material, but it actually produces a more stable product. In this case, the COPE arrangement breaks one of the bonds in that cyclopropane, and that breaks that three-membered ring, relieving ring strain and torsional strain. And that pushes the equilibrium forward. So this really just scratches the surface of sigmatropic rearrangements. They do get a lot more complicated than this. But we've covered the basics, and we've looked at two really synthetically useful reactions as well.